Hey everyone, this is Ben Atkinson at LinkedIn, and this is our series of interviews on inspiring leadership and challenging times. So each week we interview a leader about their journey to become a lead in leadership and the uh, trials and tribulations they've um, had along, along the way. Um, if you're watching, please like, share, ask questions. It'd be great to um, have you involved. And um, as always, we have uh, my friend, and our um, resident leadership expert and coach, Jonathan Bowen Perks. Um, who are we interviewing this week, Jonathan? Thanks for watching, Ben. I'm just uh, watching the site and seeing if we can make it live on both your site and mine. At the moment, I think it's just on yours, but um, if it does go live on my site as well, that would be great. Um, we're very lucky this week to have Lieutenant General Sir Nick Pope, KCB CB. Um, I, uh, I've been very lucky to have Nick on the very first um, a LinkedIn uh, series of interviews that we did, and uh, and also on the podcast as well, uh, Inspiring Leadership, which people are very much enjoying. We're on episode 53 at the moment now. Um, Nick and I go back 25 years when we were at Staff College, and he's been in the Army 40 years. Um, he's just um, finished as being the Army's COO or CEO. Sort of, It's um, uh, been a very senior role that he's done, and now independent strategic consultant and a chairman in the third sector. But um, I've always admired Nick's different views and challenging thought and sort of strategic level thought as well as down to a practical advice. Nick, welcome. Good to have you back on the show. Um, Nick, we, our first thing that we're going to think about you know, is inspiring leadership in challenging times. Um, as you've been in the fortunate position of um, having just handed over in the early part of the year, about January, you sort of finished your time with Her Majesty the Queen. And, and as a senior general looking at what's going on from your experience that you've had before, what uh, advice would you give about dealing with a crisis like COVID-19 and people in different businesses and what goes on? Interested in your general views and insights. So Ben, uh, Johnny, Jonathan, it's great to be um, on this session today. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, it is interesting. It's great to have you. It is interesting right now. Um, you know, you can look across the landscape and um, um, I'm, remind, I'm reminded actually of a quote by FDR Roosevelt in 1933 in his inaugural speech when he said, the only thing um, that we have to fear is fear. And kind of the country in many respects, uh, you see sort of uncertainty and um, panic and unpredictability and ambiguity um, having this kind of uh, extraordinarily negative feel in many respects. So um, fear leading to kind of anxiety and in my sort of level three areas, you, you've got fear of medical fear, fear, medical uncertainty, fear of me or my loved ones or my grandparents mm. coming up with uh, this, this horrible killer disease and dying. You've got fear of the um, economic impact. Am I going to lose my job? Have I lost my job? Where's my next paycheck coming through? And you've got fear of the social impacts. When am I next going to see my mates? This lockdown, you know, having spent time with my family who I never really liked in the first place. So it's, that wasn't a personal reflection, by the way. That's just a general. <laughs> it's so, a good save. Before, my wife got this in <laughs> before she goes off to save everybody, <laughs> Neil. Yeah. <laughs> my wife's a my daughter. She, she, she's, she, she's a hero. Um, so fear and, and dealing with fear requires leadership. And where do you get leadership, leadership from? If you go back two days ago, um, there's an event in the calendar called uh, Arning Board Sunday. And it happens three times a year. And it's when about three or 400 young men and women turn up at the gates of those hallowed portals at the Royal Military Academy, Sandhurst. And they enter and they put a badge on their chest which says, uh, on the motto, serve to lead. And so Sandhurst and the army takes these young people from across our society and it trains them in the art of leadership. And indeed, you've probably seen it as we go through the crisis. I, I recall a couple of instances. The first one was a, was a video of Nick Carter, General Nick Carter, the Chief of the Defence Staff, speaking uh, as part of the five o'clock briefing team in the number 10. And the second one was images of young soldiers doing um, some of these pop-up testing sites around the country. And you might recall the third one of uh, medical, military people, logistics people, helping out building Nightingale hospitals. Now, none of them may actually have been tan uh, uh, 
you know, completely central to the work that was going on. But the thing that the army brings in, not only leadership, it brings in this sort of feeling of insurance policy, feeling of reassurance to the nation. And so I love the fact that my old service gives us this great sort of vehicle for leadership and a bundle of young men and women capable of doing extraordinary things to act as an insurance policy for the nation. Mm. That to me is, is a great area to sort of start in the area of survival in, in crisis. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's really good. And, and what's been, you know, think about some of, there's a whole range of different people listening, um, CEOs of their own businesses, um, uh, small business owners, entrepreneurs, um, we'll come on to later talk about charities, um, private schools, mental health organizations. What's been, you know, if you had two or three top tips about sort of how you do uh, cope with this on a personal level and if you're leading a team, you know, getting lower down from the strategic to the tactical. What, uh, we what start the we're starting here at the tactical level, obviously. And what, what Sanders does is to take, as I said, you know, people are coming in from, from very, very different walks of life. And it says, is there a common uh, piece of DNA strand that we can wrap around all these individuals to enable them to cope with crisis, to lead in crisis? And I don't know, Johnny, whether you remember as well. Um, I started out in my, my military career back in about 1870, <laughs> arriving at those front gates for sand test to do a three-week course before going to university, a pre-university cadetship course. Mm. And in those three weeks, I lost a stone in three quarters. I had about right. an average two, two hours sleep a night. It was the most brutal, dehumanizing <laughs> But it taught me so much. You know, I had no military experience before going there. And on day three um, of my time in the army, I'm leading what's called a platoon attack. I've got a, a group of 30 young men in those days um, attacking an enemy, and I'm getting orders and telling them what to do. So I'm in a pressure situation, a lack of knowledge, a lack of certainty about so many things, and people are looking to you to make the decision, to set the task, to cohere the team in a way that also plays to individual strengths. And that's what Sandus does. It's not rocket science. It breaks things down to task, team, and individual. Mm. And I love the way that that gives me a framework to think about anything um, that I then uh, have dealt with in a challenging situation post Sandus. Because I always go back to that, that lovely sort of architectural framework to build on. And when you yeah. go from level of task team and individual we'll come on to all those and unpack them in a minute i think to the higher level when you become a strategic leader you add context as well so you start to think about the environment that you're operating in and how you might shape that so so rudimentarily task team individual and then context sort of gives you a, a sort of a, a vehicle to operate within that's fantastic and yeah let's let's unpack it a bit nick T take us take us through task team and individual and then perhaps we could have a a discussion about you know an inspiring leader that you've worked with yes, who you, sure. you thought was particularly good in a crisis or historical or, or real and then also what about that team and how did good teams work together yeah so i mean let's start with this idea of of um uh, of, of task and individual Actually, before you do leadership in the military is a values-based leader leadership so you arrive at sandhurst and you swear an oath of allegiance which carries unlimited liability that is an extraordinary thing to do. It's not ordinary. No many, not many people do that in life. But that kind of sets the framework. Now let's start with task. And actually, in a crisis, task is the paramount thing. I always try and think, so what does the end look like? What does good look like? What's my purpose? And that's the first part of your task. And that really applies now in, in, the, in the modern sort of crisis scenario of a COVID-19 session. It's very easy to get drawn into the here and now and to attend to things that are happening today or next week because, uh, because you can see that they feel really, really well. But a strategic leader needs to think beyond that, say, okay, as we start to think beyond lockdown, as we start to think beyond the end of the next year and into the following subsequent years, what things do I need to do now to set the framework to make sure that I've got a viable uh, business model if I happen to work in the commercial sector? or even indeed in many areas of the public sector, to make sure I've got a viable uh, entity as I go into the longer term. So mm. understanding of your purpose is the first thing. 
Next thing, make a plan. Sounds dead easy, but it follows from the purpose. Come up with a plan, what you are aiming to do. Next thing beyond that, take that plan and make some decisions. But make your decisions in a way that's uh, evidence-based and reliable, um, um, but make decisions. And finally, um, work out your risk framework, your risk appetite. Um, uh, risk is not about, I think it was Rommel who said that risk is a chance you fake, you, the chance you take. Uh, if it fails, you can recover. A gamble is a chance taken. If it fails, recovery is impossible. So understand when I use the word risk, I'm talking here about understanding what might go on in life, understanding what I might do to mitigate it, and managing where I want to sit on that risk-reward curve. So that really is your, your first part, your, your task. Uh, and as I say, in a crisis, the task becomes very important. Capture Hill 52. Stop people dying in hospitals. Stop people dying in care homes. Understanding what you have to do around all of that. The next thing to do is to work out what you do with the team. And um, in many respects, a great business starts with team a long way before task. Teamwork is about training, it's about communicating, it's about leadership and followership, and it's about a sense of shared experience and shared identity. Now that takes time. It's rather like trust and reputation. But trust and reputation and teamwork take a long time to create. You can lose them very quickly. They yeah. take a long time to form. And then finally, individual. An individual, when I talk about individual, I'm talking about the team who work with you, the individuals in the team knowing their strengths and weaknesses, but equally yourself as an individual. Understanding your strengths and weaknesses and understanding how you as an individual relate as a leader with those under your command if you're privileged to command people to lead them. Mm. Now, the whole of that shaped together as a balance. You've got to get task, team, and individual together in the right uh, sort of framework. At times, tasks will be important. At times, teams will be important. At times, individuals will be important. Think of it as a triangle, each of them sitting at the ends of the triangle. And it doesn't have to be equilateral. Sometimes it's, it's not equilateral. But broadly, think of it in that sort of way. Yeah. That's a, that's a really lovely uh, explanation of that and very practical too. And, and really on that topic of the individual, the individual leader, let's say, and the team, what has been your experience of inspiring leaders who've worked well in a crisis uh, and also how, how teams have worked well, both historical and, and personal ones you've had? Yeah, I'm going to give you an example of a, of a um, uh, historical leader who kind of flicks my switch actually in the sense that um, in a crisis, you've got to have an understanding of an, in of an individual who can understand the context of the crisis, be adaptable within that um, uh, sort of uh, changing context, if you like, have the uh, ability, the gravitas to command those who he has in his team and to control their fear, to control the level, to dampen down the level of uncertainty, to instill this idea of a unity of purpose. But at the same time, to have the humility to listen and to learn and to look after the team. And the example I give you is the Antarctic explorer, Ernest Shackleton. Yeah, yeah. If you remember back to the 1950s, um, his ship, the Endurance, was, was on a sort of a scientific mission in the Antarctic, and it became frozen in the... It became locked down, effectively, um, if we can use that horrible phrase again. Locked down 105 years ago in the permafrost in the ice. And so, um, what did he do? Well, in the first instance, he had to worry about um, the purpose. The mission had changed. It had gone from um, a scientific experiment to survival. Um, so, what does he do? What does he do? He, he, the first thing he does is to establish normality. So, the sailors carry on doing debt clearing tasks. The scientists carry on doing their scientific tasks. But he's then adaptable. The ship starts to... Uh, break up, so we shift the operation to the ice cap. The ice cap then becomes potentially non-tenable, so he shifts the operation to um, uh, a, a, an island nearby, an uninhabited island. Recognising that the island's uninhabited, he then takes a small team on one of the ship's three remaining lifeboats and sails 800 miles, multiple miles, to an island that he knows is inhabited. 
He then makes three um, trips over the next three months to try and reach his remaining crew back on that bleak island. And he didn't give up, and he carried on going. And when he did get to the island, expecting to pick up bodies, all of the crew were alive, and he managed to mm -hmm. rescue them. So at various times in that mission, he had task, he had team, and he had individual, and he concentrated on all of them. And in so doing, displayed, in my view, extraordinary leadership in crisis. Yeah, it's a, it's a brilliant story, and, and it's a real story. And then, and then, what about what about teams, Nick? What would you? Um, what would so you... my team, my team example I want to share is uh, it goes back about uh, twelve or thirteen years now, and it's a time when I was uh, commander of a signal brigade based in Germany. So I was working uh, with the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps, delivering sort of in information and communication services, and also life support. And we, as an organisation, as a headquarters. We're going to Afghanistan to act as the NATO headquarters in Afghanistan. We were going to unify NATO's command in country, taking over from a lot of the American activity. And my boss at the time was then Lieutenant General David Richards, latter the uh, Chief of the Defence Staff, and now Lord Richards of First Monso. And he was a brilliant leader, and he understood his team. And what did we have that made our team special? We had the ability to train well together as a team, to know each other's strengths and weaknesses. Um, he, he was brilliant at empowering his team, at, at understanding trust and playing to the strengths of each of his individuals. Um, he was great at using humour as a tool to gather the team together. And he was a fantastic family man who recognised the importance of the rear base while we were abroad. And so prior to actually leaving to go to... Afghanistan. We worked together on our team, we worked together on our individual strengths, and we certainly worked together on the task in hand. And consequently, in the uh, ten and a half month uh, sort of holiday that I had in Afghanistan, we were well, we were well configured to deliver the task in hand. Um, so it was a great journey. I mean, there were various parts within that, in my own specific task and in my own particular brigade, which, which resonate well. I mean, one of the jobs I ended up doing in Afghanistan because I was providing three or four functions. I was providing UK communications, NATO communications, life support for the um, OSAC headquarters, and actually um, we provided in the end a composite battle group to provide uh, security in the eastern half of Kabul. But the fifth thing that I had to do uh, was uh, to be uh, David Richards' uh, communications officer, his media officer. Mm. So I have to say... That's not something that I've ever envisaged doing in my life, and neither have I trained to do. So you go back onto your soundness principles of how the how the heck do you work in crisis? And by crisis here, I mean dealing with the enemy, if you look at it that way, or in this case, the media. Um, and it generally works for right, actually. I have to say, we I used to do a patrol around Carthage with the international media community. I used to call a patrol with Pope, and we'd go out for three hours, and we'd talk about, I don't know, um, Security development, public sector development, law, governance, uh, counter narcotics, whatever the flavour might be. And the only time it works in my disfavour, we had a, a very well known journalist, female journalist, came out who, um, and I won't mention her name, but we went out on patrol, it was a great patrol, came back, and she went down to Helmand and went out with three para as they were going up the Sangin Valley. And she was the first journalist to come into contact. Uh, with with Taliban and lost her handbag and wrote a great <laughs> scoop. And that night she sent me an email. It said, "Dear Nick, coming back to Kabul tomorrow. Um, been working on my suntan in Helmand, looking at the stars. Fancy dinner, um, love, XX." Which was fine, apart from she sent the emails to my Hotmail account, which was duly opened by my wife, seven thousand kilometres away. <laughs> who blew the roof and phoned David Richards' wife, who phoned David Richards, who used it as a weak chink in my armour for the next um, six months. Or. So be careful, be careful about who you give your personal hotmail accounts to. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's a lovely story. I did want some amusing stories, and that's a really good one. Yeah. Any other stories in, in crisis, um, whether it be in Afghanistan or different parts of the world that you've been in, when things have gone wrong, really badly wrong, maybe even been your mistake, and, and how you sort of laugh it off and, and, and take the mickey out of yourself? 
And I think that, that, that part about self-deprecation, I think, is something I, I have relied on quite a lot in my military career. Um, my, my style of leadership, I would call um, relaxed, not casual. Um, in that, and it's not autocratic. Um, as a young Royal Signals officer, as a young infantry officer, you'll turn to a soldier and it's quite a hierarchical form of leadership and you'll say, do this, do that. And generally it's, yes sir, salute, turn to the right. I remember turning up for my first um, troop in Germany, um, giving a set of orders, and the first, and he didn't write any questions, and the first hand went up, why? And it kind of completely threw me. And actually, I was dealing with soldiers who, in, in many cases, in fact, in the vast majority of cases, were my intellectual superiors. And so, for them, just following an order wasn't enough. And explaining the purpose behind what you were trying to do really, really, really mattered. I mean, one of my guys, um, Lance Corporal Spence, had four A's at A level. And his, and his hobby, this is back in the early 1980s, his hobby was writing gaming software programs. And he made a lot of money from it. He made more than his military salary. And I just remember having a conversation with me, why do you do this military stuff as well? And he said, well, it's, it's, a, it's a guarantee. Um, and the hobby is not a guarantee. Yeah. So, so understanding your team is really, really important. You know, you will, you're not going to be as a leader, the subject matter expert in every area. You need to acknowledge the fact that your job is to play on the, the strengths and the knowledge and the experiences of a whole variety of people who you have a privilege to command. I think it's a very good point you make, and I was just um, listening to some recordings of people doing meetings earlier and then feeding back to one of them. It's just a low-level leader in an organisation. Uh, and, and the purpose and the why, I said, you, you know, it was missing from that meeting. And not surprisingly, it was not a particularly good meeting. Because if unless you've got a clear burning why, they don't want to even be there. Why, why are they there? And what's the decision that's going to come from it? It's not an update. That's no good to have a meeting. Don't bother going to it. If there's no, what someone calls a Dan's ad, decision, action, next step, who's accountable and delivery deadline, don't go to that meeting. It's going to be desperate. And uh, don't even send your deputy because it makes it miserable for them too. Um, get get purpose. That's great. So we'll, I'll, I'll pass over now to um, Ben. Ben, you got some uh, quick fire questions, and uh, have we got anybody uh, coming up on your on your site? Because I say my my site uh, is no longer live, so um, it's all on your site at the moment. Yeah. Okay. Great. So um, uh, yeah, Nick. Th thanks so much for being being on board. It's uh, been super interesting so far. Um, so anybody that's watching, please do like, share, uh, ask questions. It'd be great to get um, get some uh, feedback and uh, some questions for, for, for Nick as we go along. Um, as we wait for that, we, we uh, every week do a quick fire round of questions entitled Healthy, Wealthy and Wise. Uh, this is uh, an aim to pull out those habits and, and uh, things that you sort of live your life by that have made you successful. Um, well, that's the hope anyway. So um, if you're ready, we'll, we'll, we'll dive in and uh, start with healthy, which, as as you know, is, is pretty um, uh, uh, relevant this week, being um, Mental Health Week. So you've been in loads of really tough, high-stress um, environments and situations. How do you stay healthy, both mentally and physically, um, during, during high stress? Um. It's a, it's a great question, Ben. And I mean, let's start with the the, uh, the physical side, but actually, more importantly, I'll get onto the mental side in a minute. So the physical side. So what do I do? My my main thing, having been a pretty useless pedestrian hockey player throughout my career, um, was to um, five six years ago. I'm a big shock. Um, I think I mentioned this last time to you, John. My daughter rang me um, from Jersey. Um, to tell me um, that she was pregnant and it really, really hit me um, because the idea of being a grandfather was mm -hmm. not something that had ever crossed my mind before. Um, uh, and and it, I mean, when you get to that stage, it's probably about 20 years away for you, Ben, it really, really um, <laughs> undermines you because you suddenly think you're about to, to die of old age and senility. Um, and I was down the pub with a mate of mine, and I know we're not allowed to get on the pub anymore, but we will be one day. Um, I was down the pub with a mate of mine. He said, what is wrong with you? And I said, no, no, I'm about to die. And he said, come on, let's start canoeing. <laughs> so, and so we started canoeing and did the Devizes Westminster Canoe Race um, wow. the following year, which is, I have to say, the most br brutal thing I've ever done in my life, bar none. It's had 23 and a half hours of pain. 
Mm. But, you know, we carry on canoeing and, you know, uh, we, we canoe together, socially distancing, of course, um, on Sunday. Um, that, that sense of uh, getting off the water with endorphins taking around your body as your hip reflexes are screaming is actually a great, <laughs> great feeling. Um, so so is it 23 hours of canoeing? Yeah, I know, it's nuts, isn't wow. it? Wow. <laughs> and in fact, staying with that for a moment, Nick, if I just jump in and then let you carry on. Uh, uh, there's a lovely guy, Jonathan, who's a, a Royal Marine, and he only has, I think, one arm. He lost the other arm and both legs to um, uh, an IED in Afghanistan. But such an inspiring guy. And, and he did that devises um, uh, yeah, I know contest. That. And uh, he did it with another colleague, and he, he said he had the three rules. Rule one, uh, keep paddling. Rule two, shit happens. <laughs> rule three, if rule two applies, go back to rule one, <laughs> keep paddling. <laughs> and because he found he was behind all the time, the time stops that he had to make, and they're about to make them um, have to get out of the, the water and give up on it. And he was so determined to do it, and he did actually make it, but one hell of a guy, and uh, raising money for... Um, army charities for, uh, for people who need it. I mean, it's a nuts event. All endurance events are nuts events. But this one, I mean, I'm, uh, it's just mad. Crazy. Crazy. Uh, it's kind of, but it's in the DNA now. I, mean, I know we, we had my, my canoe buddy fell out uh, of a canoe. We were going through what's called a portage where you're going around a lot. So you climb out of the boat, get back into it. And he, and he fell out as he got back in. And his body collapsed on him a bit. And he had muscular aches and you know, buttons oh. hit. So for the last six or seven hours, we were in a bad state. So yeah. we know we we know therefore we've got a better time inside us. Um, <laughs> and um, but but I also know that my body clock is running down. We need to therefore do this quite quite soon. So yeah. so be April twenty twenty one. I'll be after Spencer. Um, yeah. Well, so, well, our old mutual, our old mutual friend uh, James Bashel or Bash as we know. Him. Um, he's the commandant of the PT Corps, and they advise him against what he calls junk miles. So five k is about fine, but don't start getting in yeah, fast that's... many miles because it's it's inflammatory on the body. It's uh, not a good way. Yeah, this is this is junk miles territory. You're right. <laughs> yeah. But but equally, the, okay, the more important part of, 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 of um, health is, as you say, but it's mental health. And one of the one of the organisations I'm lucky enough to work with now is an organisation that. Um, it's a bunch of ex-military people actually who've been through difficult journeys themselves in the mental health area. It's mm. working out how to be living in that area of mental health rather than tipping over into respiratory um, health. So, so you know things you can do in the mental resilience area, in the area of um, preventative and protective measures, understanding your level of mental health before getting into treatment, I think is really, really important. What do I do? I do, I do, I use a series of apps um, to help me think through various challenges on a daily basis. But actually one of the funny things I do as a mechanism, so Joe and I go walking every morning with our Labrador uh, up into the woods. And actually being in a wood in itself is very, very calming. It gives you time to pause and to reflect. But the, but my key thing is actually my chickens. We are the proud owners of um, nine new chickens. Um, three, are, three are ex battery hens. And if the Cray twins were the Cray triplets, my, my battery hens are the Cray triplets. Um, and then I've got six very socially demure upper class chicken hens, all these, all these new hybrid um, breeds. And I have to say, they're brutalized by the Cray triplets. The <laughs> but they get free reign of the garden. And um, that's great fun because you can lay on the lawn and they're quite tame and they come up and have a bit of a, a chirp around. That, 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 that's a great way of maintaining a sense of calm and balance. And we all need that, as I say, in a time of uncertainty. Just taking that little moment out. Wow. Work. <laughs> so get some chickens. <laughs> get some chickens. <laughs> the thing in I love it. What, I love it. Change your life. Going down, going down in the morning and picking up eggs. Is, mm. is just it's a magical feeling uh, maybe i'm just um a little bit simple in life but actually yeah. getting nature's products be it eggs or vegetables or picking salad leaves and coming back yeah. and producing something with it it's it, it takes you to the good life and maybe it was called the good life for a reason because it is kind of spiritual and mental as well mm. as just you know um uh, uh, sort of transactional 
uh, mechanism in nature, and you lose that in the modern context. We lose yeah. we lose this sense of, of grounding ourselves in the earth. Yeah, 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 totally. My um, my wife's um, sister, uh, she's uh, she's just had, got a lifestyle block out now in in um, New Zealand, and they've got chickens and two two young yeah. kids, and those chickens can barely sit down to lay an egg before the kids are in there, sort of like <laughs> collecting the eggs. It's uh, it's been been great for them. Uh, but, but yeah, I can, I can see how that could be could be a nice relaxing thing to it's a good take thing your mind off the world. Well, we're very lucky. It's lucky if you've got a garden to do that. If you're living in a flat, um, in my son, <laughs> my son works in India uh, as a teacher at an international school, and mm. you know every country has a different way of dealing with lockdown and the challenges associated with it. And you know, in in India, Prime Minister Modi basically said, "Okay, we're going to lockdown, so there are no mm. leaving your flats." And by the way, there's no alcohol. Now my son likes people. So for him, eight weeks without alcohol was an intellectual challenge. <laughs> a mental, I mean, he was going nuts, actually. <laughs> Just, you need to find a mechanism through that, that, that kind of period of uncertainty. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Excellent, I love, I love that example. So, so moving on to wealthy, um, and you can interpret that how you want, but but I, I just think at, at this time it, it'd be nice to get some advice to people, um, whether it's uh, whether it's useful or not. But is there a best piece of advice that you've you've ever had about money or wealth that you, you'd like to share? So I did economics at university, so I know nothing about money. Um, <laughs> um, uh, but I always my my you join the you join the public sector. You're not going to make money in life. You're not going to get a reasonable job security, a reasonable income. But it's not something that's going to put you on the front page of the Sunday Times rich list. And so, really, I, my principle throughout my, uh, throughout my career has been on an individual level, following the McCormick, McCormick principle. You know, um, annual income twenty pounds and expenditure nineteen pounds uh, nineteen and six result happiness. Annual income twenty pounds, annual expenditure twenty pounds, naught and six result misery. So in other words, Gordon Brown's idea of prudence at the kind of you know average annual level kind of worked for me. Yes, you can leverage money. Uh, yes, you can borrow money, but but living within your means, I think, has been something that I've tried to follow on an individual basis. And throughout my military career, I mean, I've kind of been an itinerant military programmer throughout most mm-hmm. of my career trying to make the bottom line corner of a spreadsheet equal zero. So trying to balance departmental ambition to buy ships and tanks and planes against the budget. And that is also a prudent conversation because politically that's a very difficult thing to do. Everybody wants more, but you're having to make difficult decisions. And that idea of prioritisation, you've seen it actually in the National Health Service recently, Mm. the area of PPE, because we've recognised that actually... Our NHS, as I, you know, I mentioned, I think earlier, our, our NHS is the third biggest uh, employer in the world behind Walmart and the People's Liberation Army in China. Um, it's an extraordinarily great organisation, but very, very large, mm. and lacks an ability, I think, to work out how best to prioritise demand. So you saw in BP potentially those people who shouted loudest, getting most um, sort of uh, uh, benefits. And that's not necessarily the best outcome. Um, you know, it takes you, in many respects, back to Kipling's analogy in his poem, if you, know, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you and make allowance for their doubt and say, that's the kind of territory you're in here. Um, mm. The ability to prioritize really, really matters. So, look yeah. at the long answer to your question. <laughs> okay, so uh, final, final part of this uh, quick fire section. Um, just a uh, uh, Wisdom, so a piece of wisdom that you strive to, to live your life by. Okay, if you get one shot at this life, don't waste it. Mm. There's a line in a book by um, Thomas Hardy that I uh, recall quite a lot, okay, and it's a book called The Mayor of Casterbridge. Yeah. The Mayor of Casterbridge was a chap called Michael Henchard, and it was quite, it was quite a gloomy book. Um, but in his will, he wrote down and I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget it, and that no mourners walk behind me at my funeral, and that no flowers be planted on my grave, and that no man remember me. Now, I don't think you can get a bark out piece of prose than that. Mm. And it's caused me as I've grown older to think about what do I want on my epitaph? Um, 
and I kind of come up with a life lived well. And that that can mean a lot of people, a lot of things to a lot of people. Mm. But actually, you've now got to go away and give meaning to that phrase. Now, some people, for some people, that will be about making hod loads of money and leaving money and leaving a legacy or whatever to others. To me, it's about adding value to society. Um, so between now and end X for me, that's kind of where my focus is going to be. How do I best add value to society? Yeah, fantastic. Great. I like yeah. that. So let's go into, thank you, Nick. Let's go into part two. And um, uh, I mean, just even before we do start thinking about charities, schools, mental health awareness, mm -hmm. mental resilience, things like that, you know, your views on what's going on with COVID-19 at the moment and how people can be aware of what's about to hit them, the tsunami that's coming their way. Um, your wife, Jo, is a doctor. She's working within the NHS. You know, what's life like, uh, you mentioned about the chickens and things, but what's life like for you and the, and the kids and your wife and how are you managing it all, really? Uh, Groundhog Day for all of us, I think, is an interesting fact right now. Um, because, you know, if, if COVID had happened three years ago, before um, Zoom or uh, Google Meet or Microsoft Teams or, you know, LinkedIn Live or whatever the, whatever the social media streaming mechanisms that we now have, COVID-19 would have been very, very different. Lockdown would have been very, very different. We'd have been meeting on, I don't know, BT meeting on a, on a telephone conference crew rather than having social media. So social media, I think, has given us a richer experience. But you can go so far, you can go so far with um, social media before you start missing human contact. And essentially, Homo sapiens are a contact species throughout history. We've survived on social grouping, social gatherings. And I think that one of the um, interesting uh, challenges facing society as we come out of lockdown on an international basis is how you get back to social gracing, social interaction uh, and communicating on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Mm. You've seen an awful lot of stories now um, coming up of companies who are saying, actually what's happening right now is showing us that we can change our, our working model. And yes, I absolutely agree with that. You'll see a lot of companies, I think, doing an awful lot more working from home because they can now do it from a communications perspective. And possibly giving up or foregoing on some of their expensive rental options in central London or whatever, going for a, I don't know, a satellite solution. But at the same time, there is a balance to be struck here because you miss those conversations about challenges or alternative ways of looking at problem set or the, I don't know, the coffee queue conversation which just talks about, what if we did this? Because you don't really get those on Zoom. So I think that the, one of the interesting challenges there is, is, is how we we retain the best of what's happening in, in social distancing, but also bring back into organisations the plus factors that come from social gatherings. Mm. I think it's tough to, to get to know to people well in, in this environment, isn't it? I mean, without that sort of time where you're maybe going for a drink or, or, or spending time at lunch or just, just shooting the breeze of, of what, what problems you're facing, you, you don't get that sort of closeness. Um, no, I mean, you, you get to see people's offices. So yeah. I'm always intrigued by, you know, what people will have them, what people have behind on the camera. You get to see family members going past or dogs or whatever. So you'll see part of somebody's social fabric, which we normally keep quite hidden. And, mm -hmm. and you know, well, you might still keep on hearing my baby in the background. She's, was she's yeah. talking away. Uh, it's all right. It's great. <laughs> That's a human dimension, which is great. Yeah, that well, it was an even better one, Nick. Just as I was talking to you earlier, but in the door, there's this figure standing there. It's my mother-in-law who's got Alzheimer's, and she sort of, the remote control wasn't working on the TV, and she's <laughs> for me to solve it. I said, oh, come back in. And like, that's just life, is what happens, you know. That, that's exactly right. But actually, accommodating it, understanding it, and, and actually being sympathetic to it is, is, yeah. is, is great. Um, Bring down the humanity in us all. It's... it's yeah, I, I kind of buy it. I mean, I don't know if you know, there's a chap, it takes me to where do you go beyond COVID. There's a, there's a great American general, Marty Dempsey, who, who recently tweeted on this. And he said, he said, some say this crisis is going to change us. Um, then we should make it for the better, more generous, mm. more innovative, mm. more inclusive, 
more honest, more charitable, mm. kinder. We can do better than back to normal. It's yeah. Absolutely. He's spot on. Spot on. And in fact, um, I don't think, um, Ben, before I just ask some questions on things like charities, um, the next point there. Um, have we got any questions or are we still, we just carry on? Uh, one second. We've got a few people listening um, in, but no questions. Okay. So if anybody has anything they want to ask, this is the, this is the time to do it. <laughs> okay, let's go. Well, Nick, you, we were talking earlier, you're um, uh, looking after the the Gurkha Welfare Trust. You, 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 I think, are chair of the Gurkha Welfare Trust. Um, we were talking about charities, you know, um, Lee and I running the Inspiring Music Trust for Abused and Vulnerable Girls. And we we're also talking about the impact on other charities, which are um, private schools. Obviously, the state schools are going to be fine. They'll be covered by the, by the government. But what's going to happen to those? And then what's going to happen to sort of some of the mental health organizations? And I don't remember one of my guys, Jonathan Cunningham, but he runs a, uh, an NHS. Uh, no, not an NHS. He runs a care home. Uh, he's taken over his parents, and they're having a really grim time. He's spoken quite strongly about this. So what's your views on this mixture of different topics, and how do you think things are going to work out, how difficult is it going to get? Well, I mean, it's rather like the uh, if you're in the travel retail um, or the ledger industry right now, you're suffering madly, and you know, I think you can have the charity sector to that list of vulnerable communities. I know that you know, the Chancellor you know, has been uh, trying to provide some form of financial prop. But if you go through um, and try and try and envisage the next two or three years of coming out um, of, a, of an uncertain landscape, certainly um, money is going to be a challenge for an awful lot of people. And yeah. if you are in a charity, uh, and a lot of charities work quite hand to mouth, so they've got a, a demand to meet, be it providing support for vulnerable people or people with various illnesses or or whatever the case may be. So they have a demand which has been built up and there's a kind of user expectation that you're going to get help from a charity. But that, 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 that demand can only be met is if, if the supply, in this case money, comes in to provide volunteers or whatever resources you're giving to meet the demand. And that area is a problem for people and a problem for a lot of charities right now who are suddenly, suddenly coming up against a reduction in their supply if they're not carrying out the cake stalls or raising money through very, very, uh, various social events. Um, so people have seen their income streams reduced quite substantially in some instances. And I can see this leading to uh, one or two, th one or two um, sort of strategic level activities. I think the government's going to have to work out um, its relationship with the charitable sector. How much actually is the responsibility of the state to deliver and how much can it still rely on what is actually in UK an extraordinarily vibrant charity sector. Mm. In the UK, we've got to work out societally how much uh, we are prepared to put our hands in our pocket and support charities. Now, UK, UK, the population in the UK have fantastic charitable support. I mean, blow most nations out of the water. Whether that survives contacts with the COVID-19 crisis, I think is, is an unknown unknown right now. Yeah. So that relationship between government and charities and between the nation and charities um, is a really, really fundamental question coming into the next uh, year or two. And then if you are actually in a charity, be it as a chief exec or as an employee or as a trustee, working out whether you can in the short term, whether this kind of financial storm in a way which gives you a viable future, I think is, is going to be a really interesting issue. And the final, yeah. actually, in the the entire charity area, and there are, you know, there are tens of thousands of charities, not hundreds of thousands of charities in the UK, all doing fantastic things, all with their own objects and articles and independent trustees, but working out whether there's a model to, I don't know, to rationalise areas where there are um, different charities providing a similar service um, is another area that will probably need to be explored. That's very, very difficult because of their independent status. So it's so it's an area it's an area of the of the strategic crisis which I think is really really interesting. Uh, it, it's, with no easy answers. No, it's it's a fascinating one, and I'll talk in a minute about uh, one of the other charities that's going to be coming on shortly. But um, it's one of the things that Lee, my wife, finds is uh, her charities working with the Home Office and helping people in some. <laughs> 
pretty deprived areas of Grimsby and Leeds, Manchester, Liverpool, uh, and parts of London where they really need the help. So we've taken it all online as much as we can. Luckily, it's a young charity without all the shops and the other uh, places where people can't uh, meet anymore. But uh, you've interested to know that um, as we come to the end of our uh, episode, and Ben's got one question on books, I think, at the end before we finish what your reading is. Um, episode eight, which is coming on next week, next Tuesday, Martin Doherty. Martin's the, a different COO. Uh, he's the CEO of the Sanger Institute, part of the Wellcome Trust, and they're doing uh, some fascinating work supporting the country with what's going on uh, with COVID-19. Uh, but he's also a policeman in his weekends as well, which is a phenomenal thing for him to do, a real community-based guy and a, a very inspiring man. Then we've got an old friend of yours, Brigadier Jim Richardson, who is the CEO of the Hague Housing Trust. And, of course, they will be having their challenges, I'm sure, with uh, their income and how they cope. And then another old colleague of yours, Nick, uh, you may, if I could interject there, you may want to ask Jim why his nickname is Sumo. <laughs> oh, that's so unfair. That's... I know, but it's such good fun. <laughs> well, then there's another old friend of yours, Colonel Gary Hearn. Um, and Gary, who's at the UK Defence Academy, will be coming on talking. He's listened to all the podcasts and drawn some themes out for the UK Defence Academy. What he's heard, 50 different things. And then another link to your comms days, um, but not someone you know, Angie Klein, who's a VP at Verizon, the, uh, the, the US telecoms company. She's going to be calling us uh, in episode 11 from... New York. So uh, over to you, Ben. Ready for the, the wrap up? Yeah, thanks so much, Nick. That's been really interesting. Some really great advice and some some lovely stories there. So fantastic. Thank, thanks for, um, for for coming along. Um, so we we always ask everyone that comes on along uh, just for a book recommendation. Was uh, it's always nice to sort of see either a book which has been really sort of um, uh, inspirational for you over, over your life or just something you're you're enjoying at the moment, especially yeah. Uh, with lockdown um, across the world. So what, I'm going to cheat here, okay? And I'm going to mm. spend quite some time getting to the art, not quite some time, but a couple of minutes. Because <laughs> you can take that, I mean, what's your favourite book? It's almost impossible to answer. Um, yeah. you know, I'll flip across you know, a couple. These kind of books, that inspired me at university. It's Keynes' you know, general theory of everything. And I, was, I became kind of a neo Keynesian in my economic outlook. So from a university perspective, answering essays, that was my kind of point. Um, going back into my job as a chief operating officer and a chief executive of the army, you start to look at strategic books. And the ones that kind of flicked my switch were kind of Legacy by James Kerr. Yeah, I love it. Talks about the New, yeah, well known. Talks about the New Zealand rugby team and what the All Blacks did to become a great organisation. But particularly this one, Black Box Thinking by Matthew yeah. Sire. And I sat next to Matthew at. Um, he came and spoke at the Army General Staff Corps uh, Conference. We have a dinner night every time we have one. Matthew was one of our speakers. I sent next to him, great bloke, um, and I got a free book out of it. So, so <laughs> it, was, it was really, really worth it. And I think go down, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of interested in, in history. Two great books, and one of them is one of my recommended ones. So Sapiens, well-known, yeah. well yeah. worth a read. But fundamentally, this one by Ernst Grombrich, written in 1935. Um, and if you know, he wrote it in six weeks for children, but it's got some fantastic stories in there for adults as well. So read that if you want to try and understand where we as a race, as a human nation, are going. But finally, then come down to sort of you know, your 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 literature, if you like. And I'm kind of I, I, I read quite a lot of old literature, so you go back into sort of you know Hardy or Thomas Hardy or, or whatever. But also yeah. First World War. Two or three great books that come out of the First World War or later on. I, I, for me, In Evil Craving by Brian Keening or A Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich by Solzhenitsyn or uh, Birdsong by Sebastian Folks or Pat Barker's Ghost Road and the Ghost Road Trilogy from the First yeah. World War. They're great. My, my book I go back to time and again, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen. Why? Because it talks about human frailties and human emotions, and it ends actually ends well, and that's a good way of ending a story. Uh, and a good way of ending the episode. And you need to make sure you, you see Joe before she goes off to the NHS. Nick, thank you very much for your time. Ben and I and all those listening will really enjoy this. And uh, good luck um, with all the things you're doing. And thanks for your time. Yeah, God bless both of you. Thank you very much. Stay healthy. Thanks,